Highly interesting presentation, and let's now come to the big experiment. So people are connecting cables, and so on. You can see Jeffrey Kiel already on the picture. He is the head of the climate change research department at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, NCAR, in Boulder, Colorado, and he work, has been working for 25 years uh, in this sector of the climate change. And he is also the head of the Community, community Model System project, where the community of global modelers so try to meet this challenge uh, for modeling and to improve the modeling. And, and so I see that Jeffrey we are Keel here on my small monitor. Hi, Jeffrey. Great to see you. Welcome in Annaberg. And let's see whether this works on the projection. And Alina will have to tell me what to do if I have to do anything. You still need a little bit of time? Okay. Wir müssen nur ein bisschen geduldig sein. Das kommt schon hin. Das muss irgendwie We so have to be patient. Gehen. At the end, it works out. It just has to be calibrated. Was ich persönlich Ich halte lieber die Klappe. Can you, can you hear me? Well, thank you uh, for this invitation to speak about uh, climate modeling. I've actually changed the title of my talk a bit to the current status of Earth system modeling rather than just climate uh, system modeling. And we'll see the difference between Earth system modeling and climate modeling in a, in a second. Here is the outline of my presentation. Uh, just a brief statement on what are the certain changes, the things that we're most certain of in terms of change. I know that you uh, heard a talk earlier today on a, a, on a summary of the IPCC fifth assessment report. So I'm sure much of uh, that material was covered then. What I really would like to talk about mostly today are the current challenges in Earth system modeling. And there are many challenges, but I've chosen to only speak about two given uh, the limited time that I have. Uh, uh, and in particular, I want to focus on challenges of simulating Earth's global water cycle, which is, since water is so important to uh, social and economic systems. I would then like to finish the talk briefly by talking about the challenges of communicating climate change science to various sectors of society. This is a topic that I've spent a lot of time, uh, much time working on over the last uh, five or six years, and it brings in my interests uh, that are involved with psychology. I have degrees in psychology as well as the physical climate sciences, and I've been blending those to look at this issue of communication. So, certain changes. Well, uh, perhaps the most certain change is uh, from this, shown in this figure, which is the observed warming uh, in the 20, end of the 20th century. These bars are decade average, 10-year averages of the surface te temperature around the world. And there's this clear signature of warming and continued warming uh, into the 21st century. We know what drives this, of course. It's the increase in carbon dioxide and uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide for the most part. And uh, I just wanted to leave you with this figure uh, in terms of certain changes. 
This is a re paleo reconstruction of the levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide starting about 5 million years ago and going back to about 45 million years ago. And the red bar, the dark red bar, is the projected levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide by the end of this century, in other words, in about uh, 90 years, uh, with a range due to estimated emissions, differences in emissions. And what this clearly shows is that uh, on our current trajectory of emissions, uh, by the end of this century, we will reach levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide that are roughly three times what they are now, two to three times what they are now. And the last time that, that uh, those levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide existed in Earth's atmosphere was about 30 to 35 million years ago. So uh, essentially what we are doing uh, through the uh, burning of fossil fuels and emitting of emission of carbon dioxide is over a century to two centuries returning the concentration of atmospheric CO2 to levels that Earth has not seen for order 30 to 35 million years. So the rate of change of climate is, is quite unprecedented. So what are the current challenges in Earth system modeling? Given, given this uh, situation of rapidly rising greenhouse gases and uh, a need to understand how Earth system will respond to those rapidly rising levels of carbon dioxide, the most comprehensive tool that we have to date to answer questions about climate change are Earth system models. Where we stand now with the issue of uh, developing and improving uh, climate and Earth system models is really twofold. It's one of what I call here complexity and resolution. By resolution, I mean the spatial scales that we can uh, resolve within our Earth system models. And I'll give you a better example of that uh, in just a few slides. Complexity is Earth's cl climate is the result of complex interactions. It's not just a physical climate system. It's physical, it's chemical, and it's biological. And these processes in integrally interact with one another to create uh, the climate system that we see. In terms of resolution, we know that Earth's climate is the result of processes operating over a wide range of space and time scales. In fact, it's actually over a range of 10 orders of magnitude in space and time. If we look at the evolution of uh, climate models to uh, what are called Earth system models over the past 30 or 40 years, this is a figure from the uh, Working Group 1 report, uh, you can see this evolution of complexity. In the 1970s and 80s, climate models were much simpler than they are today. They essentially were composed of an atmospheric model, a land surface model, and then mo models that uh, simulated oceans and sea ice. And over the last 30 to 40 years, we've evolved these models to the point where they now not only include atmospheric processes, land processes, ocean and sea ice, which are the physical processes of the system. We now include aerosols, which are clearly dependent upon chemical processes, atmospheric chemical processes in the atmosphere. We include a carbon cycle and dynamic vegetation. These are integrally coupled to uh, biological processes, both the marine and terrestrial ecosystems that cycle carbon. Uh, as I said, atmospheric chemistry, the prediction of ozone and other species has also become an integral component of Earth system models. And the latest uh, process that's been added to these models just in the last few years are glacier or continental glacier or land ice models. All of this is to essentially build a model that captures the most important processes uh, within the Earth system. Of course, the problems that come with this complexity are, first of all, uh, the models are far more difficult to, to interpret because you have all of these processes that are inter 
interacting with one another, but they are also more computationally expensive to run. And so what paces uh, the development of Earth system models is not just the scientific uh, understanding and observations to drive that scientific understanding, but also the, the computational power that we have uh, to run models uh, to simulate Earth's climate. I just want to focus on one process of complexity, and that's the Earth's carbon cycle, since uh, what motivates much of the uh, research is to understand how carbon dioxide is going to increase in the future. And this is a, a cartoon uh, of the, our best estimate of the carbon cycle. And what clearly comes out in this picture is that uh, there are different reservoirs that hold carbon stock, the atmosphere being one of them, uh, but the ocean and the land play inter an integral role in cycling carbon, and not only cycling it, but more importantly, acting as sinks for the carbon that's admitted into the atmosphere. Roughly a half of the carbon dioxide emitted into the atmosphere uh, is taken into either the ocean and, or land, uh, roughly this equal portions go to of uh, that half go into the ocean and land and are cycled through uh, terrestrial vegetation or marine ecosystems. So to actually model the carbon cycle, we not only have to model the physical climate system, we have to capture uh, biological processes. This is a paper, one of the first studies to show the complexity of this and why it's important that we factor in uh, the interaction of life uh, with uh, the carbon cycle. On the left-hand side is a picture of the um, essentially the amount of carbon either emitted into the atmosphere or through the burning of fossil fuels, that's emissions, what remains in the atmosphere, which is labeled atmos, and then how much of the carbon is taken up into the oceans or land. What you see here at the, towards the end of the 21st century, the land uh, part of this carbon budget actually becomes positive. In other words, the land is becoming a source for carbon dioxide, and this is related to essentially tropical deforestation. And on the right-hand side, you see the projected atmospheric CO2 concentration, and the red curve is where we include, these, this study includes this carbon cycle feedback, in other words, the interaction of carbon with uh, life on Earth, and uh, the other curves exclude that. And so you can see that this makes a tremendous difference in the projected levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide uh, as to whether we uh, include life processes in the projections or not, which is a part of the Earth system. Not only is it uh, the couple to uh, life in, in terms of how much carbon is taken up, the efficiency with which carbon is taken up is affected by what makes life uh, grow on the planet. And one of the nutrients that life needs uh, to grow, either on land or in the ocean, is nitrogen. And th these are projected maps uh, global distributions of the amount of nitrogen deposited at the Earth's surface for the near present day, the 1990s, and then projected out into the future. And so this shows how the atmospheric chemistry couples to the carbon cycle. So again, what I'm trying to convey here is a level of complexity that's involved now in Earth system modeling. And it's important to note that the amount of nitrogen that's deposited on the uh, surface of the Earth critically depends on things like cloud processes or pers and how much rainfall uh, occurs in specific regions. Now I want to just move on to resolution. Uh, hopefully I've convinced you that uh, we need to include things like chemistry and biology and models if we're going to understand the carbon cycle. But as I've just shown, 
cloud processes can affect that. And clouds are, are very small uh, objects. This is a, a, a figure showing different processes in the atmosphere and what their scale is, their spatial and their temporal scale is. So you see on the, on the x-axis, the spatial scale going to, from one meter up to thousands, tens of thousands of meters, and on the y-axis, time scales going from minutes to many years. And these ph processes and phenomena span uh, close to 10 orders of magnitude. So if we're going to simulate these processes and models, we have and incorporate them, we have to figure out uh, how to best add them into our model simulations. Some of these processes of order 50 to 100 kilometers or more, we can explicitly resolve in the models. Smaller processes like small clouds or fronts or tornadoes uh, are too small to explicitly resolve in models, and so we must parameterize them. Here's a, a picture of how we've evolved over time uh, in terms of what we can simulate in models in terms of their spatial scales. The, in the first assessment report, our models were typically run with grid boxes that were around 500 uh, kilometers in scale. And in the second uh, assessment report, that scale was almost halved. And you can see that we're, we were running models that resolved scales of order 250 kilometers. In the third assessment report, we made some progress in going down to smaller scales. And in the fourth assessment report, mo many modeling centers were running global climate models or Earth system models at order 100 kilometer, kilo, kilometer resolution. And you can just, by looking at the vi visual picture of this, we go from a situation where we could hardly resolve uh, the, the features of, of Europe, say, to <clears throat> the, the fourth assessment report where we were doing a fairly good re job in resolving uh, things like the mountains and other topography. Well, we didn't stop there. Models, we are now running uh, global climate models at even finer, higher resolutions. The top panel shows about a 90 kilometer resolution and the bottom panel shows uh, a 30 kilometer resolution. And many centers are now run, running their global models at order 30 to 50 kilometer resolution. So you can see that we're at a point where we can actually start to make more accurate uh, predictions in terms of regional phenomena like uh, soil moisture or precipitation. What do we get what, by improving the resolution of these models? This is a figure that uh, we've created here where I work. Uh, it is the, the modeled sea surface temperature minus the observed sea surface temperatures, annual mean. So this is essentially the error or bias in the simulated model uh, sea surface temperature against observations. And you can see the top panel with a two degree or 200 kilometer uh, res res resolution atmospheric model, the biases are fairly large, uh, especially off the west coasts of North America, South America, and Africa. But when we go down to a atmospheric resolution of 50 kilometers, that's the bottom panel, most of those biases disappear. The reason for that improvement is that we are more we, are, we can accurately now resolve the winds that uh, blow or flow uh, along the coastal regions, which uh, brings colder water up to the surface, thus reducing those warm, biased regions off the coastal regions. This is another example of what we obtain by going to higher resolution. The top panel is the observed annual mean rainfall rate, uh, a climatological mean. 
and the bottom panel is from a 25 kilom global 25 kilometer resolution model and you can see that uh, you can barely see distinguish the difference between the observations in the model in terms of rainfall rate. This would have been very difficult to simulate had, had uh, we run these models at coarser resolution. So we're now at the point where we can look at features. This is just another one. This is a model run at very high resolution, a cloud system, a frontal system moving across the Atlantic. The bottom is a satellite observations of the clouds, and the top is a, a global climate model simulation. Again, uh, we're reaching the point where it's almost impossible to tell the difference between uh, reality, the satellite observations, and the model simulations. These are probably the large, greatest breakthroughs we've made over the last few years in modeling, in our ability to start to model very small scale features. All of this now relates to how well we, we can simulate how water is cycled through the atmosphere, which is extremely important for humanity. These are projections, uh, at end of century projections of uh, changes in soil moisture. Uh, the various panels are the, the representative concentration pathways. Uh, the 2.6 is the, the pathway that assumes some mitigation. The uh, lower right-hand panel, the RCP 8.5, is the so-called so business-as-usual uh, scenario. And what these show is that uh, there is, because of uh, the warming planet, there, there's projected significant drying in many parts of the world. And so what we really want to do is understand how water will change in the future, given its importance in, for things like uh, agriculture and just water needs uh, for uh, humanity. These are more uh, detailed uh, figures. The left-hand panels are the temperature that's projected to occur. Uh, in the top panel is the summertime. The bottom panel is the wintertime. And the uh, center panels are the center panel is the extreme uh, events that are to occur, heat of heat waves essentially. But I want to call your attention to the panels on the right, which are related to precipitation. Top again is summertime precipitation changes, and the bottom is wintertime changes in precipitations. And what this shows is that uh, these, this is an, uns an ensemble of models. And um, the stippling, uh, stippled area shows where models agree to, uh, rough 80% of the models agree in terms of their predicted or projected changes in rainfall. What should stand out here is that there are a lot of regions that are not stippled, which means that there is a, a tremendous spread amongst the model's projected changes in precipitation. And this is the thing that we really want to improve upon. In other words, we want to be able to narrow the uncertainty in projected rainfall rates for regions like Europe or the United States or other parts of the world. Let me just leave this part of uh, climate earth system modeling with a topic that play, is, plays an extremely important role in how much rainfall will fall uh, in regions like Europe. And that is the issue of what are called atmospheric rivers. This is a 50 global 50 kilometer uh, atmospheric and ocean simulation of the world for present day conditions. And I would like to just point out these strands, these green yellow strands of water vapor that are flowing out of the tropics towards uh, the, the northern and southern hemisphere, polar regions. If you can see uh, two strands of water vapor that are flowing out of the tropics in the Pacific and are flowing towards uh, California. 
And if you look to the right, you'll see a strand of water vapor that's coming out of the Caribbean and flowing up to uh, Europe. These are the so-called atmospheric rivers that explain uh, close to 90% of the transport of water vapor out of the tropics into the high latitude regions. They're very small, thin filaments, uh, and therefore you need high resolution to simulate these, but they play a very important role in extreme precipitation events. This is a study that was recently published showing uh, this, the importance of these filaments of water vapor uh, to transport and extreme precipitation events in Europe. You can see the, the, the vector lines show you the direction of which the water is full, vapor is flowing. Uh, there are regions where they hit uh, the United Kingdom. There are other instances where they go further north uh, to the Scandinavian countries. And then there are other times when these rivers hit um, France and Germany. They play a very important role in extreme precipitation. This is that same study showing the number of uh, the top 10 annual maxima precipitation events. In other words, extreme precipitation events. And how they're, and these, are, these events are directly related to those atmospheric rivers that are coming out of the tropics. So being able to simulate those rivers and where they hit the continents and how much rainfall they contribute uh, to specific regions is very important to understanding Earth's water cycle. We are actually cal cal calculating or doing simu global simulations uh, here at NCAR. Uh, here's a river that comes out of the tropics, crosses the UK and uh, reaches uh, continental Europe and uh, the bottom right-hand panel shows the precipitation that's associated with that river. And you can see that when the river hits the continent, European continent, there is this large uh, pink area of excessive precipitation that's falling uh, in the European uh, continental region. This is just to convince you that uh, these rivers are playing an extremely important part in climate change. And indeed, that's what we want to do is understand how those rivers behave and then um, how they may change as we go to a warmer climate. Now let me just briefly say something about challenges in communicating climate science. There are actually a number of problem, uh, barriers that exist to communicating all the science that we're doing uh, to the public. Uh, I just want to focus on the bottom two. There's socioeconomic and cultural dimensions, and in particular, I want to focus on the psychological dimensions. I really don't have time to cover all of this. Mike Hume's uh, work uh, clearly uh, uh, addresses uh, a number of these issues, especially issues related around value systems, and how even if we have the best science information, that information is going to be uh, processed along with a person's or a society's value systems, which are constructed from a number of different uh, processes, including social constructs, political systems, and even uh, psychological processes. And in, in, indeed, psychological processes we now know play a an extremely important role in how we decide the level of risk uh, associated with something. And let me just uh, say that this, these uh, psychological processes bring with them a strong affective response or reaction, and that those affects affect uh, how easily we can understand or take in uh, the science. We actually have ways to defend ourselves against strong uh, affect. And we need to understand those processes in order to better frame the science uh, that we uh, present uh, to the public. So this is a summary slide where 
scientists work with observations, theories, and models. And what their job is is to come up with better narratives, essentially, to frame that science using narratives that uh, account for, for uh, the value systems that can that that societies hold, that sectors of society hold, that affects their ability uh, to uh, understand uh, the science that's presented to them. So in summary, uh, Earth system models uh, can successfully simulate many features of the past and present climates. I didn't have a lot of time to show you that, but that's the success story of these models. Models continue to improve both in terms of resolution and complexity. One of the more important signals in the climate system that we're looking at now in terms of the water cycle is how it will resp respond regionally to greenhouse warming, and in particular, how atmospheric rivers contribute to extreme precipitation. And then briefly, uh, that cl the communication of climate change science inevitably involves psychological factor factors, in particular affect, and that we need in framing climate change science, we need to account for these factors uh, in and how they're affecting people's ability to take in or understand the climate science. And with that, I will end. Thank you very much. Jeff, can you hear us? Can you hear us, Jeff? Can you hear us? He switched his, his micro out. Yes, okay. I can. Oh, beautiful. Can you hear me? Okay. This, is, all right? this is your calling. I'm happy to see you, and thank you very much for your presentation. You received a major applause here from the audience, and I think you can see some oh, of the you. audience. So I can. I understand that you are open for some discussion, are you? Yes, yes. Okay, so while I look around for arms coming up, I may already address one point, and um, that links to the previous talks that we had. Really, despite the major technical progress that we are making in global and earth system modeling, there is not really news in the qualitative sense. Would you agree on that? The, the qualitative sense or the, the quantitative? Is, no, I mean qualitative. The signal directions are identical. We have quite substantial quantitative improvements, but yet they do not question, yeah. let's say, the third or the fourth assessment report results. I'm not sure I understand the question about qualitative. What what is okay? I rephrase what that. What is missing? I, I rephrase that. Uh, the question is whether the Earth system model improvements have really made for a change in our general understanding on the meta level. Well, I I guess uh, if I'm interpreting you correctly, the statement. Uh, is that with the improvements of complexity and resolution, the, the uh, general uh, sense around warming and how the climate system is going to change has not been affected by that added complexity. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, it depends on the questions you ask. In, in other words, if you're just focused on large-scale changes, hemispheric or continental-scale questions, then I would agree with you. Although, what I did show is that by including the feedbacks in the carbon cycle, you can get significant changes to uh, what you'd estimate uh, without those. In other words, uh, this is the, sink, the, the you know, understanding how the terrestrial and and ocean sinks are going to change in a warming world. 
those 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 feedbacks are essential to understanding how much more warming will occur as we go into a warming world. And we cannot understand those without including something like a, a detailed carbon cycle model. So in, in, in those, it's, it, it always comes down to the questions you ask, right? If you ask um, a particular question that requires uh, information about biological processes, then clearly you need to include that level of complexity in an Earth system hub. If you're not, if you're asking a question that's not really uh, affected strongly by biological processes, then you don't need that level of Earth system complexity. So it, it really comes down to the, the questions that you want to get from the model. And some questions will require that added complexity. But in terms of, uh, you know, the general message that has come out of the IPCC reports for the last uh, two or three, two reports in particular, no, the message hasn't changed. Uh, I don't view that as uh, troubling. I view it as it, it's a disturbing enough message that means we really need to do something about the problem. And that, that you know, we understand things on the hemispheric to continental scale in terms of especially temperature. You know, the water cycle is, is a greater challenge, and it's a greater challenge because of the resolution issue that we cannot explicitly resolve the processes that uh, because their spatial scales are so small, and so therefore we have to parameterize clouds and rainfall processes. And everybody parameterizes them in a different way, which is what leads to the spread of uncertainty. Thank you very much, Jeff. I fully and wholeheartedly agree. My question was mainly directed to this interface of the discussion with the general public and decision makers. But okay. I, see, I see more yes. questions coming up, so maybe the microphone is handed. Or Aline, does he have to come up here, or how does it work? Oh, sure. Uh, Christian is, is asking the question why the uh, fifth assessment report does not reflect the increased level of accuracy in the Earth system models. And he very much thanks you for your presentation. Well, um, you know, the IPCC process is a, it, it needs to reach a consensus, all right? And so I, my feeling about the IPCC reports is they are always co more conservative in terms of uh, how they, how, the way they state things, all right? So the modeling community may feel more confident about a particular aspect of modeling, but it's not just modelers who are writing the reports and especially who have to, you know, less the final report so everything every sentence has to s sort of fall more to the uh, conservative way of stating things than the more I would say central way of stating things so uh, I don't think modelers are overly optimistic in terms of they know what their models can do and what they cannot do but when you're writing a consensus report uh, you're always going to fall to, to a more uh, conservative statement about how well models can simulate things. Yeah, thank you very much. That certainly clarifies this point. I'm looking around here for voices. I think the, the very key issue that you touched was the second or last part of your presentations where you were talking about, let's say, the psychology of communication and communicating. Yes. Uh, let's say, large global challenges. And uh, we have been discussing this issue already with various talks by Mike Hume, by Gunter Tiersch. And um, 
we feel that this may be an even bigger challenge as compared to our more technical questions. How do you see that? Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I agree with that uh, because you're working with, uh, you know, psychological processes. You're also very much so working with sociological processes. Uh, you know, these are far more complex than Earth system models. And so to uh, work and un to understand how we can create better ways of communicating to various, uh, you know, diff different uh, countries, within a country, different uh, social sectors. I think that's absolutely, that to me is the great challenge right now. I mean, the, the modeling will continue, will continue to improve the models, but how do you uh, convey the science, the most important science, to the, to, to the people so that they can make informed decisions? That, to me, it, and that's something that the IPCC process does not deal with, okay? And so uh, it's up to others to, to find solutions to creating narratives that convey the science as, as well as possible, but in a way that uh, different sectors of society will understand uh, so that they can make informed decisions. That really, to me, is the is the important part where we're at in terms of is, is, is in communication. Thank you very much. That was a very, I feel, I feel very strongly about this. <laughs> Thanks. I feel very strongly about this. There is another question here, and I just ask my colleague to come forth. Thank you. Hi, Jeffrey. My name is Enchi. I'm a member of the regional uh -huh. parliament in Saxony. Very impressive, pres impressive presentation, if I may say so. Um, I'm thrilled by the idea that the sharper you get in space, uh, you may be able to um, get the municipals and the regional authorities involved and um, just yeah. turn the process down to the bottom and pile it up. Uh, so if you don't... Yes have a chance to discuss climate change on a global scale, which obviously is the case. Wouldn't it be very interesting to start uh, newly from uh, the regional level and the municipal level and just say, uh, this is what will happen to our region, to the place where I live, um, and, and in a couple of years when my children are grown up, and uh, make use of your modeling, because I think this is a thrilling idea and would overcome communication problems. With Yep. Yes, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, you know, uh, it's very important to look at the global picture. It's where we have a lot of uncertainty. But people don't live globally. They live in a specific region. And so they're going to relate most to um, changes that are predicted for their specific region. And so I, I think it's really important to bring the climate change story down to the regional level so that you create dialogues at those regions where people are going to feel most engaged, most mm. connected. I agree with you. Thank you. If I may yep. just follow that up a little bit, would that not create, let's say, a little bit of a conflict between the limitations that we are facing in respect to psychological challenges and the more stronger mental signal yes. for something to happen locally or small regional scale type. Well, I, I, that's exactly what happens. I know when I speak to uh, local groups about climate change, immediately what you have is affect. You know, people were going to react to this information. It's it can be disturbing and often is disturbing information. And so that's what I meant by you, you cannot ignore the, the psychological effects that are in the room that are, are people that are experiencing. And so it's a question of how to develop communication uh, uh, pathways that include the role of affect not exclude it or deny that it's happening, because you can't. It will happen. And that's going to be different. People will react differently depending on, on 
you know, a perceived level of loss. I think one of the ways that I've been thinking about this um, is in sense of what does a person perceive that they lose in, in the presence of climate change? And if you could begin to understand what the perceived loss is, the anticipated loss is, then you can actually uh, create a more effective dialogue around the issue, knowing what their feared loss is. I hope that makes sense. But, you know, uh, let me give you an example. In this, in the United States, a one fear, we, individual, the right of an individual to make choices is extremely important. Okay. And so if you start to talk about mitigating uh, greenhouse emissions, they perceive a loss of personal freedom, which, which is a very strong trigger uh, for people in the United States. And they immediately will start re resisting uh, doing something about the problem. So you have to work with that set of perceived loss. Uh, for other groups, it may be financial loss. Often the argument is made if we were to do something about this problem, there would be economic repercu repercussions, you know, recessions. So there the perceived loss is one of income or financial. So to understand first what the perceived loss is, you can then begin to work more with more creative narratives to communicate science to those people. Thank you very much. That's uh, a psychological. Yep, yep. I do not see any more arms raised, and I'm very sure that your uh, contribution here was also a lot of food for thought and new insights. Uh, I was personally very, very impressed about the humidity modeling results that you were showing. That was really new to me in that accuracy. And so I think I should say I'm very happy to see you alive and kicking after all that. And uh, <laughs> I appreciate it. thank you so much for going through this ordeal. We benefited from it, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, and a big applause to I Jeff did. Keel. Thank you. Okay, so we'll switch off now. How do I do this? Close, okay. Oof, it worked. <laughs> Thank you to Aline and Uwe and all the team. Und Sie dürfen mir glauben, das war technisch gesehen keine einfache Nummer. You can believe me, technologically speaking, it was not very simple and easy because the technological basis, as already said, is quite lacking means and... Uh, but